thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, I really appreciate all of you being here today. Um, I am just going to start by introducing myself. So I'm a photo-based artist, and uh, I work mostly in Ottawa, but also in Mexico City, uh, sometimes upwards of uh, three or four months a year. I build elaborate sets. As you can see in this photo, uh, collecting insects, animals, plants from all around the world, and I put them together um, to create these scenes. Uh, and I photograph them using glass plate negatives that I make myself. Um, it takes about two days to construct something like this. There are a few different layers that go into it, and uh, it creates that sort of tactile, um, otherworldly feel in my images. So we don't just come to a place where we can create something like that overnight. So I'm going to take it back, way back. So I grew up uh, in rural Canada, uh, rural Quebec, um, outside of Chelsea in a tiny pocket in the Gatineau Park. And my family was known for rescuing animals, so we, uh, this was my third pet raccoon, I think. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we re rehabilitated turtles with broken shells and you name it, um, I've had it in my home. And I spent a lot of time as an only child just exploring nature and my friends became these animals and my surroundings were the woods. So when it was time to uh, head off to university, art school was an obvious choice. I came from a household of artists. Um, but when I got there, I felt like I didn't know what I was trying to say. Like the other students in my program, um, they had a voice and I didn't know what my voice was. So after, a period of time at school, I decided to leave and I moved out west and I studied scuba diving. I became a master scuba diver instructor and I taught dive masters to do deep diving and night diving and wreck penetration diving. And that took me to my new home here in the Seychelles. So, uh, I, I saved for a number of years and I moved here and I did volunteer work uh, studying the recovery rate of coral after the La Nina event of 1998. And biology along uh, with the arts is obviously my, my other passion. And so I worked there and this was me. Oh, it's an animal encounter. I forgot I stuck that in there. So that's me, um, very happily working in the water and uh, in the ocean, it's probably where I'm happiest. Um, I started using a camera at that point, I'd never really used one before, to help me with the research that the scientists were having us do. If there was something that I didn't recognize underwater, I would take the camera to it and bring back those images and we could decipher what kind of coral it might be, uh, different fish species, uh, turtles, things like that. And at that point I decided I had found a tool and I thought I was ready to maybe explore what I wanted to talk about with my artwork. So I headed back to Canada. My diving changed a little bit. <laughs> that day I had to, that was two days, one day digging a hole seven feet deep in the ice, the second day diving under the water. Um, and I can probably say that was the most surreal experience of my life, being able to walk upside down on the ice underneath. 
Um, it's clear, and there are bubbles that come down, and you feel like you're walking on glass. It's really something very special. Um, so I continued to work in diving. I was teaching disabled people how to scuba dive uh, and giving them a weightless feeling, just a sensation that they couldn't experience in their daily life. Uh, and I went back to school and I studied photography. And during my two years there, uh, I obviously couldn't be doing documentary work, which is what I thought I was going to go back to. Um, so I discovered glass plate photography and I experimented with it and I, I learned the process and I made it my own and I started to love that tactile aspect of really uh, being able to affect something with your hands. And I began to create these animal works. They were based off of uh, an interest in the hunting community uh, near where I grew up, something that I felt disconnected with. And so it was a way for me to explore um, this idea of uh, respecting the, our food, where it comes from, and our idea of mortality. What does death look like? Where do we go after we die? Why do we try and make death look like life? And this um, sort of respect or disrespect for the natural world. And I don't know if I necessarily found the overall answer, but it clarified things for me. And I continue to love having that conversation with people. And I hope that this work did do that. For this piece, I had to uh, go all the way out to the Bruce Peninsula. It was like an eight hour drive and pack up a dark room in a truck. And magically, I found this piece of woods two kilometers out from a house. And the neighbor there had had a wedding the year before. So she happened to have a plug that ran out into the middle of the forest, which is very helpful for me. So I could shoot it at night. <laughs> Some things are just a bit serendipitous. Um, and this piece, um, and the rest of the pieces that were becoming more elaborate at that time actually ended up taking me to Mexico City for my first international show uh, and also to South America, which was a really cool experience to arrive on another continent and have your work up on a billboard. Um, so along with uh, my own exploration in my artwork, I felt like Latin America was much more receptive to this idea of discussing mortality, uh, talking about death, uh, the rituals that surround it. Uh, and so I started looking for residencies and different programs that I could do um, in Mexico, uh, in South America. And while all of that was going on, I walked north. <laughs> I took a backpack and I walked through Bolivia took a jeep through the Altiplano there. This was an absolutely incredible place. That lake is actually that color. It's full of a plankton and pink flamingos come there to feed every year, which was also really interesting. This island in the middle of the salt flats, um, every rock is made up of an ancient coral seabed. So everything you pick up has um, fossils, uh, ancient coral that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, th that's all it is. It's a seabed. So to see history evolving and changing and to know that there used to be an ocean there and it's just salt brine surrounding this island was very special. On that trip, I also uh, spent some time quite far in the Amazon. I found a family that, uh, whose, whose parents had a large swath of land along the Peruvian Amazon and they were going to sell it for farming. But the children, um, they decided that they didn't want that to happen. So they studied uh, tourism and they created a sanctuary for very few people to enter the Amazon. Um, I think it was eight people at a time right on the edge of the research zone. So unless you had a scientific project, you couldn't get that far into the Amazon otherwise. Uh, so we spent eight days on a dugout canoe going up the Manu River. Uh, this was a special day for me. I found this tiny silk structure underneath a leaf and I think two months prior I'd been watching National Geographic and I knew that there were a team of researchers actually looking to figure out what animal had created this. Uh, so to know that I was part of something that was still uh, unknown and to be there, it wasn't on television, was, you know, it makes it very real. 
And uh, the next day, I got out of the canoe to go pee behind a log. And it's a winding river, and so I went to hide behind a log with another girl, and you know, we're undoing our pants, and I look down, and I see cat prints, and then she screams bloody murder, and I look up, and there's a jaguar standing between me and her on the log. And it jumped down onto the sand between us, and we shared a moment very quietly while this other girl was screaming bloody murder. <laughs> and then it disappeared into the jungle. And I think it was at that moment that I realized what I was trying to say with my work as a whole, and it was this connectedness. And to really share um, that feeling that I have inside me, that, that that passion and that excitement is the only way to help our environment and to be excited about it. Not in a depressive way, like, like it's going down the drain, but in a way that you, know, you really realize how magical it is and what we have to save. So there's a little bit of time in there where I came back and did commercial photography, you know, photographing bathrooms for Minto homes or whatever, but uh, we can skip those slides. <laughs> Then uh, I went off to Mexico because I did find a residency um, with the Museum of Natural History in Puebla, just south of Mexico City. And I went for Day of the Dead and explored uh, more about mortality. Even though my mind was sort of on to the next thing, you know, we have projects and we have to stick with them and finish them. And I met a lot of people, really amazing people, and talked to them about their rituals and traditions and uh, it was truly eye-opening. They just have parties in graveyards. It's great. Uh, on this trip too, uh, it was sort of the beginning of my um, excitement surrounding uh, plants and our, our medicinal use of plants and another way that we connect with nature. And I finally got to photograph my jaguar. I tried to make it a little bit like it was in real life, but I'm not sure. So coming back from that, um, I had moved on into this, this plants and insects stage and uh, into the impossible uh, bouquet, which was something that uh, fascinated me. Uh, you know, in the 16th and 17th century, something like this would have been completely impossible. These plants come from all over the world, they bloom at different times of year, there are no cameras. So to have something like this is the ultimate luxury. It's truly impossible and the artist would have had to travel around the world, have researchers bring specimens back, uh, you know, press flowers, imagine things. So for me to think about our time now and being able to create something like that through ordering whatever I need on eBay or uh, going to the market, you know, things travel from all over the world. Was, it uh, truly, um, it, spoke, it speaks about our time. One artist in particular that I uh, am very interested in is uh, Otto Marsus von Schrieck. His close friends called him the sniffer because he wandered around smelling all sorts of amphibians and plants and things. Um, but he uh, really created these other worlds in the underbrush and uh, this this is really felt like where I came from truly this was my childhood and these are the things that exist in my mind and so I created some work in his honor <laughs> and then I began my impossible bouquets uh, some of these flowers actually open after they die, so it continues on the theme of mortality. But uh, I wanted to create something absolutely next level. And I, I titled this one Monster because it really talks about consumerism and our interaction with nature today. And these underbrush scenes. And so through time, things become more complicated. Uh, my studio at this point uh, was creating these minute details. I tried to use snails, but they moved too fast, 
so I had to build them myself. <laughs> my negatives are only ISO 2, so it's like 70 pops of a flash to take one photo. And all of the insects that I acquired from sustainable insect farms, where families would be using slash and burn farming uh, to make money, could then uh, sustainably harvest insects and maintain the ecosystems. So um, either antique or museum collection or sustainably sourced insects, I would get into the studio and you have to relax them and pin them. So for every insect in every image, there's another story. And then there are some special things that I have acquired. Uh, this deer came from a deer reserve in the States. It was stillborn, it was never alive. And uh, I acquired it uh, and saved it for years. And I only actually just used it about three months ago. Uh, also natural pigments made from insects and plants uh, was another exploration. I'm painting these flowers quite often, uh, making them look a little different than reality and adding uh, my own feel to them. So they're not straight photographs. It actually, it's becoming harder and harder for me to call myself a photographer uh, when the photo is the last thing that I do and I'm spending six months sort of sourcing things out and creating scenes. From there, I uh, got into heliogravure printing. So like I, it's not complicated enough already. Uh, I wanted to do copper etchings of my images and create these iconic um, scenes uh, sort of creating like a deity out of my images. And this was the first time I got to work with a team. And that was a surreal moment for me because uh, I, I guess I just figured I was like a kid tinkering around in a, a closet somewhere until this point. And then I realized, wow, these people are taking direction from me and they, <laughs> you know, they're experts in their field and we got to work together to create uh, something really special. This is in Mexico City. So these pieces through a chemical process would be um, etched into copper and then with a 5,000 pound press, um, pressed onto beautiful Parisian paper. I think I, I killed them. <laughs> it was a lot of long days and uh, very complicated work at that size. They're some of the largest um, heliogravures ever made. And there we have it. That was my year this year. And so when I think back to uh, being 17 and my first day at Concordia University and feeling like I had nothing to offer, and then I take a look at this piece and my year, I, I wandered through the jungles in Veracruz, Mexico, one of the most biodiverse places in North America, with a team of entomologists from UNAM, searching out insects, learning about their ecosystems, moving roads. Um, there's my team. And some of the terrain we climbed through. And going to, to almost Guatemala to find these cacao pods where I could legally uh, take them out of southern Mexico to photograph them, to buying I don't know how many plants and exploring markets and dragging friends out to jungles to fill my car with things, to finding this space and turning it into, that's my rescue baby, <laughs> and turning it into this. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. And, uh, you know, it makes you realize that your imagination is valuable and you have everything you need in your brain already. You just have to trust it. And you can create something magical. When I was a kid, I used to uh, collect plants and flowers for the dinner table. And my mom would ask me, you know, if we had people coming over for dinner, when you could you make the bouquet for the middle of the table? And so I'd go out and find, find different things and bring it in and dinner would be beautiful and there would be candles and everyone would be talking about politics and art. And 
my mind would always wander to that bouquet in the middle of the table where inevitably there would be a caterpillar that I didn't realize was on there or an earwig would fall off of a flower and run across the table and no one would notice. And I think that that's the world that I still live in. Um, and I hope that my work lets you go there too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was absolutely amazing. Uh, what a talk to start off the year. 2019, here we go. Um, I'm, we're going to open up the floor for questions. We have a mic here um, if you'd like to ask a question. Um, but I wanted to know a little bit more about your process and to, like, how long does it take from forging and getting all these pieces um, and putting them all together to create these surreal landscapes that you do? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so, it's fairly elaborate and it, it depends on the piece. Sometimes it can take a week if I find the right things and I, maybe I have insects already that I've been holding on to. Um, but if I have something in my mind like that pond piece, I think I had that in my mind for two years. Uh, every element in that photograph is something that is scheduled to go extinct within our lifetime or our children's lifetimes. So there are coffee plants in there, in there. There's, there are chocolate plants, um, there are carnivorous plants and other um, environmental marker plants that talk about the health of an ecosystem. So for me to find all of those things sustainably and, um, and to build something like that, I mean, I, I had to find the perfect studio. I couldn't use flash, it's too big a scene. I actually have other versions of that photo with a model in it, uh, sort of, uh, my take on an Ophelia, uh, but, sh but I, w I decided to leave her out because I felt like uh, if you know the reference, it does look quite similar and you can step into it and it talks about our effect on the environment and our own demise in a different way. So when I get these elaborate ideas in my head, I think when I was 25, I would have said, well, that's just not possible. And now I go, okay, well, it's going to take me two years. I just have to find the right people to help me in. So uh, there's no... There's no simple answer, but I would say anywhere between two months to two years. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So, <laughs> a bit longer than a selfie. Yeah, a little bit, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions? Uh, I got a blooming boy for you to talk to. Yeah, um, Mark. <laughs> that was great talk, by the way. Love you Thanks. Stuff. Thank you. Um, what do you do with the still life flowers, the dead flower bouquets, when, they, when you're done with them? Um, I don't know if some of you follow me on Instagram, but for that particular piece, I put it out there. I was like, free plants. I had to catch a flight home like six hours later, and I had to take this thing apart. And I think I had 20 people at the door of the studio going like, can I have it? Can I have it? Like, they wanted them so badly. So I try and find them all homes. Um, if they're dead and they're not broken, then I, I hold on to them. So I actually have two storage units full of stuff, which is just insane. Um, I have people giving me things too, so it's crazy. Uh, but I, I keep the insects, I keep the animals, I can reuse them. Um, I'm also creating commercial pieces sometimes for uh, stores and that kind of thing, so sometimes the props end up there. But I try and find happy homes for them, and especially with the animals and insects, um, they, I have so much respect for them, and I'm very lucky to be able to use them. I, I always find them a home or keep them. Mm -hmm. Any other Anyone questions? Else? I was just wondering why Mexico City? What brought you there? Uh, I think originally I did a, my first international show there, and so I actually met the people that I did the heliogravure work with seven years prior to actually working with them. And because of this uh, sort of openness to talk about death and mortality in my work, it was just really received differently there. Uh, it's also a four and a half hour flight, and everything is possible there that I can't do here. I can go collect plants myself, uh, I can work with the universities, I can have a studio space. That studio space I showed you actually um, is a carport for an old historical home in the Roma neighborhood in Mexico City and um, a friend of mine is tearing it down to build condos there and he said, use it, you know, it's empty for six months. And there's no space like that here. Um, to, to rent a studio, to be able to get models, to create something on that scale would probably cost me 10 times as much. Uh, and, and I feel very enabled there. 
And culturally, it's a wonderful place to do my work also. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, you talk about using pigments and colors, but most of your stuff seems to be black and white. Black and white. Yeah. Uh, so I'm delving into colors very soon. I keep saying that. I apologize for everyone who's been <laughs> hounding me and waiting. Um, and I paint the flowers in the images. So uh, I don't know for some of you who have worked with panchromatic film before, but black and white film uh, and uh, film that uses actual silver uh, is sensitive to, uh, not sensitive to reds. So a lot of flowers are orange and red and that type of thing. So I'm having to color things to bring the tones together. I can't work with red or white or very light blue or dark pink or anything like that, so it's, it's very limiting. And so I'm actually painting things to create uh, depth and tone and different things in the images. And I don't want to use toxic paint, so I use pigments. Yeah? Pardon? I didn't hear the, the beginning. Oof. Uh, it's funny, I think a lot of people think my process is very old, it's actually not. Um, it's very similar to modern day, well, modern, to regular film. Um, and I like that it's tactile, I like that I can affect things with my hands. Uh, I have underwater pieces too that I didn't show today, but I can create waves and bubbles and it, it's this other world. You just can't get that with digital. I've had commercial digital photographers say, why don't you just take a picture of one plate and impose it on every image? And I was like, what? You don't get it, you know? <laughs> but um, I, it's not easy. I couldn't find anyone to teach me this process. And I think my career has always been just sort of figuring it out and MacGyvering things. And um, I read books and I, I had access to a huge studio and a wealth of photographic knowledge when I was studying at Spau, but uh, they, nobody did this process. So I guess I'm the person who teaches it, <laughs> if you need to learn. <laughs> Anyone else? We have time for a few more. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, are you finding any commercial success? Have you been able to sell through galleries or, uh, or things like that? Uh, as opposed to, uh, obviously you've been starting <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very lucky. I feel people connect to my work. You know, my clients will call me a year after buying a piece and say, you know, I've been sitting with this in my kitchen for a year and a half, and I just noticed that bug in there with the other thing, and I didn't know that was there before. So I feel like the world that I've created is something that people are drawn to. Not everyone. I don't expect everyone to like my work. But, um, yeah, I, I'm very lucky. I have a gallery here. I have a gallery in New York and Mexico City. And uh, they work very hard for me, and I work hard for them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah? What's the biggest creative challenge you face? Oh, oh man. <laughs> Uh, it's funny because you put together these slideshows and you leave out all the stuff that happens in between. And uh, I think in the earlier days of my career, it always felt like money was an obstacle. And, you know, it was like, oh, I spent two years saving and working as a restaurant and wow. Um, but I discovered or I realized now that I needed that time because if I had had the opportunity to take on this project in the beginning, I wouldn't have been ready for it and I wouldn't have had the gumption to probably finish it because the challenges that I faced with, with uh, that Ophelia piece in the last year were just wild. The studio I was supposed to work with, um, it was supposed to be like a residency and I arrived and they said, um, okay, great, we're really excited to have you. It's going to be $11,000. I was like, what? But we've been talking for a year, and there was no mention of this, and we talked about sharing work. And so then you go, okay, well, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to make this happen, and I just have to do it by myself. And, um, and that first residency in Puebla, I had to learn Spanish. 
there was no support. I was supposed to arrive with, to a dark room and uh, I got there and, you know, uh, sorry, our dark room's not done because the photographer got in a motorcycle accident a month ago and he just didn't do it. I'm like, okay. So you just figure it out. I learned Spanish. Um, but, I mean, in this kind of work, there's, there are no rules, and uh, you never know what's coming, which I, I kind of love, and it's also, um, it's also incredibly challenging sometimes. You just have to keep going, keep putting one foot in front of the other. I learned that talking about it is really good for you. Um, I, I guess I was never really afraid of things like that. Um, you know, the way that work is received in Ottawa, people go, oh, it's deathy, I could never have that on my wall. Or, oh, I just, blah. you know, it's like they can't even go there. Um, and, and depending on where you are in the world, there are really different views on on it. Uh, I mean, you go out to the Yucatan, and up until very recently, every year families would dig up the bones of their relatives to wash them and put them back in the ground on an annual basis. Um, now, there are government regulations. You can't do that until, I think it's about 15 years after they've, they've decayed, uh, for health and safety reasons, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I think it's to not be afraid and to tackle it and to, uh, to think about it. Mm -hmm. So you've had all these wonderful experiences around the world and Mexico City and, and things like that. And you still find yourself back here with the challenges of a not so receptive audience maybe and, and lack of materials and things, but you still come back here. Mm -hmm. so what are the reasons? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, actually. <laughs> um, Beautiful weather. Yeah it's, yeah, it's so lovely, the balmy, the balmy weather. Um, no, I, you know, I have a family here, and I lived in Vancouver for six years. Um, I'm in Mexico City often. Ottawa's a wonderful place to come back to, and, um, you know, we're a very educated population. I love my peers. I, I love the challenge of working here, and, and despite how difficult it is, uh, this kind of work makes you realize that unless you're putting something out there, uh, nobody knows what's in your mind. So you can talk about it all you want, but once the work's out and it's on the gallery walls, then I, I, I'm feeling like people are more and more receptive, and um, maybe I get to inspire the city to be a little bit more wild and crazy. <laughs> like me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, can I? Oh, okay. got one more. I just, uh, that picture of the box, uh, oh, yeah. I can just imagine the feeling you must have had when you realized you captured that image. I'm wondering, is that one of the first, like, because I, I, rem I remember catching a picture and you get that feeling like, oh, I caught something that, you know, nobody's caught before, like, I captured what I wanted to. So, um, well, but I wonder, like, how did you feel at that time and what was the first time you kind of had that feeling? Hmm. Yeah, I guess that, w that one was sort of the one that, um, that sparked sort of my growing studio practice, having to travel with equipment and really plan ahead and make massive lists. You forget one thing and the whole project goes bust. Um, and it did take me to Latin America. I don't know if there's any one point where you realize that you can do something or to be more excited than you were the day before. Um, but I think I got hungry uh, the day I graduated from college because uh, there was another peer, uh, I think it was someone who had taught me at one point, and he told the director of the school, this is the best work she'll ever do. And that's the day I got hungry. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.